grab one of those bananas. Okay. Alexander Dawson is in fifth grade. Like every other public school student in San Francisco, he hasn't been to school since March. Did you grab you a spoon? No. My husband passed away. My son was five and a half turning six. You can catch the bus or did you want to walk? Um, walk. You can walk. Alexander is a little worried about me. I think it's just stress and trying to take care of so many people and so many things that um, it feels like I'm kind of losing myself a little bit, you know? Barbara Thomas works as a home health aide taking care of senior citizens and can't be around to supervise Alexandra's distance learning. You know, um, the teachers have to call me sometimes and be like, Barbara, Alexandra hasn't did this project and this project. But that's only started since they had to do the social distance and do the computer work. But before that, he was doing pretty good. Let's roll out. What kind of effect do you think that's going to have on his education being distance learning for this long? I don't know, but I would love for him to actually be able to graduate high school, go to college, do all the beautiful things that I wasn't able to do. For the past few months, Alexander's been going to this community hub, one of 74 sites currently serving 1,300 students of the district's 52,000. These are students the city worries are most at risk with remote learning, like those who are homeless, in foster care, or public housing. The hubs are run by the Department of Youth, Children, and Families, with money usually reserved for after-school and development programs, and are operated by community organizations and the Parks Department, completely separate from the district. 27.8 for Alex. Love you. Our hubs operate from uh, 8 to 5.30, 8.30 to 5.30. You can see on the mirror there the Zoom schedules. Not all of these kids go to the same schools, and they, they're not all in the same grade. So every kid has a different schedule? Every kid has a different schedule. Raise up hands, who wants yogurt? So this is a mix of learning, homework assistance, and then some enrichment. The population of kids that we're serving are, are high-needs kids. These are children that are, are not doing as well in a virtual learning environment. But what shouldn't be lost on any of us is that my staff are essentially operating a pop-up classroom. And, you know, it does make one question. What? Make some question? Well, if we're, kids are coming here to go to school, maybe kids should just be going to school. Public schools in more than two-thirds of California's counties are already offering some form of in-person learning. In San Francisco, more than 70 of the city's private and charter schools have permission to reopen. But the single public school district and its teachers' union say they still don't have the money or the testing they need to bring everyone back safely. What do we want? From the key. Why do we want it? From our schools. What do we want? From the key. Why do we want it? From our schools. What do we want? Do you see a path to reopening? What does that look like? Um, I do see a path to reopening. What we still see lacking are the resources. Not enough is happening, and we could do more if we had more. There are private schools that are starting to open. They have money to set up the physical spaces, fix the ventilation in their buildings. I wish we could do that. Nobody chose distance learning because we thought it was a better way to teach kids. Was it frustrating to see in some of these conversations the teachers' unions be presented as sort of like an obstacle to reopening schools? Yeah, it was difficult to hear that because what we're really looking for is a chance to get back when it's healthy to do so. And unfortunately, what we have seen around the country, including in some places in California, are schools that reopened too soon and had to shut down again because there were COVID cases. We've been in this place since March. When you look around, who do you feel the blame lies with? With Trump and his administration. 
the fact that public schools can't be open right now and that this is a very difficult situation for parents can both exist at the same time. It's not a failure of public education, it's a failure of our federal government. We have to set a priority. You know, budget plan is a moral document, and we're failing our kids if we don't put the funding there. Studies suggest the time kids are spending out of school this year could hurt their mental and physical health and their careers. Is this your class? Yeah. Do you have a hard time hearing people on the class? Yeah. Until the district solves its safety concerns, most kids and their families are on their own. That's why parents at San Francisco's Rooftop Elementary came up with a plan to help each other. So how did these come together? It was after the meeting with the school district and it was like a big Zoom meeting with like 2,000 people and I was like, they don't have it figured out. Socialization is so important for this age group. I was really wanting something like this because I'm a single parent <laughs> and I go to school full time and I have an only child. So my daughter was, I felt like was really struggling. Gail Cornwall, who has three kids at Rooftop, led the effort. You're getting exercise. She and a few other parents teamed up with the principal to split the whole school into pods, small groups who could help each other get through distance learning. What was the original idea? We thought, can we create pods within the community that are equitable and also inclusive? Like, you could see there's five families and um, the kids go to one house each day of the school week and they learn together in a group. Maybe that's with a parent helping or maybe one of the people who used to work in the after school program could be there. What was the principal's reaction? She was extremely supportive and just put in a tremendous amount of work to split the class lists into pods that reflected the whole student body. And they did it really intentionally. They looked at just about any metric they had. Trying to make the most well-rounded groups? Yeah, exactly. Trying to make the groups that reflected the, the student body of the school. I think parental bandwidth was really important and maybe income was a proxy for that. But the plan fell apart when the district told schools not to work with pods. What happened? That is a great question. <laughs> We as a parent community never got reasons why they told our principal and assistant principal not to work um, with the pods. Allison Collins serves on the city's school board. Some of the ideas that parents were coming up with are, like, frankly, illegal. People were saying, oh, well, why can't you just give us our class list and we'll distribute and we'll call each other up? Legally, I can't give you somebody else's name and contact information. And it's all well-meaning, but there's a lot of frantic conversation. And um, we really need to have these conversations with, you know, the Department of Public Health and the school system. Are you satisfied with what the city has been doing and what the school plan is these um, days? I'm, I'm satisfied with it. I mean, like I said, this is just a bad situation. We need to move with urgency, but we have, you know, we just opening quick isn't, is not going to make things better. And I think we should communicate that to the public because parents can come up with a lot of ideas. But if, when you're responsible for other people's kids, like, that's a different question. City officials are now saying public schools won't open until January, and even then, only for some students. San Francisco's COVID positivity rate is under 2%, among the lowest in the country. Recent data suggests that if the right precautions are taken, schools are probably not super spreaders for the virus. How do you feel having your staff in these locations? I think it is possible to do this safely. It doesn't mean without any risk, but I think that the importance of the endeavor justifies that risk. We need to be paying closer attention to our collective responsibilities to engage and support the social emotional development of our children. You know, in many respects, this is quickly becoming the lost year.